Everything live then? Yep, yep. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Um, so thank you very much to everyone here for coming. Today we will be having, I believe if I can count, the fourth um, uh, talk of the Cambridge University Physics Society for Lent term. Um, today we're joined by the esteemed jo uh, Dr. James Cooper from CGG, who will be talking to us about inversion, um, reverse engineering the Earth. The Cambridge University Physics Society is very proudly sponsored uh, by Seamless, Revelane, TTP, TPP, Define, Jane Street, and CGG. And um, James here is in fact from CGG and has very kindly um, been willing to share some of his expertise, some of the interesting things about um, geophysics that they do at CGG. Um, uh, James uh, completed his master's in uh, mathematical physics at the University of Nottingham prior to getting a, or prior to spending three years in research and development in the British uh, intelligence sector. Following this, he returned to Nottingham for his PhD in atomic and molecular physics in 2009. And um, in 2010, he joined CGG as a geophysicist in the subsurface imaging department before moving to research and develop in, in 2014. James, um, you are very clear to start, and I should tell everyone that you can post questions in the chat or by unmuting yourself. Longer questions sh should be kept to the end, but if you have any clarifications, I will be bringing them up as appropriate. Okay, thank you very much, Oscar, and uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, presentation on inversion. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you all and thank you all for attending. I'm very pleased to be able to, to give this talk uh, and I hope you found it uh, interesting and uh, informative. I'd like to start uh, this evening with a movie. Um, so what I'm going to show you is a section of the subsurface of the Earth, a horizontal cross section about 500 metres uh, below the sea level. And what we're looking at here is a map of reflection coefficients, and those reflection coefficients define the various different uh, subsurface structures uh, within the Earth. So as I start the movie, we're going to descend from a depth of 500 meters to about three kilometers uh, below uh, the sea surface. And as we do that, we see those reflection coefficients uh, changing uh, and revealing different structures in the Earth's subsurface. So we're looking here at reflecting boundaries, we're looking at gas clouds, we're looking at rock faults, all of the various components uh, that go into producing the subsurface uh, of the Earth. But what's really interesting about this movie uh, is that it hasn't been obtained from direct measurements. What we're actually looking at here is the result of solving a giant system of nonlinear equations. So every pixel in this movie, and there are billions of them, uh, have, has been obtained uh, or corresponds to an unknown in that system of equations. So this example is a particularly powerful example of the inverse problem method, uh, and that's what I'm going to uh, discuss uh, today. Uh, so my name is James Cooper. I'm a research leader at, uh, at CGG. Um, this is me uh, without my rather severe uh, lockdown haircut. Um, and I work in the subsurface imaging department. So subsurface imaging is what uh, CGG does. We've just seen uh, an example of that. My research interests are in predominantly in inversion. Uh, so full waveform inversion and tau p inversion specifically. And I'll introduce those, uh, those ideas uh, as we go through the rest of the talk. The outline for the talk is as follows. Uh, so when we talk about subsurface imaging, we're talking about what we call seismic data. So I'll give a very brief overview of seismic data, essentially just giving you enough information so that you can understand the context for the rest of the, uh, of the talk. I'll discuss some very broad high level concepts of inversion and discuss uh, in brief some applications. And then we'll move on to the kind of meat of the presentation uh, where I talk about uh, linear inversion in the context of seismic processing using the example of eliminating what we call the ghost wave field. We'll then move on to more complex examples of inversion and a particularly powerful example, uh, full waveform inversion or FWI. And then I'll wrap, I'll wrap up at the end briefly by discussing how FWI can be used outside of the seismic realm, uh, in particular in the field of uh, medical imaging. Uh, a bit of housekeeping, so the, the talk for tonight will be about an hour, maybe a little more, um, uh, plus any questions uh, that uh, come in either during the talk or at the end. Uh, I'll be showing lots of examples of seismic data. So seismic data is acquired in a, in a 3D sense, in the real 3D world, um, but uh, because of the restrictions of my 2D presentation, I'll be showing different perspectives on seismic data. So in particular, I'll be showing a lot of horizontal and vertical cross-sections of the subsurface of the Earth. 
I'll also be rendering that data in different color palettes in grayscale and various other colors and color schemes. Uh, there's no particular agenda to any of that. This is just for, for convenience in terms of which color palette I choose. Uh, so don't try and read it too much into if those uh, color palettes change from one slide to the next. I'll be using fairly simplified uh, 2D diagrams to illustrate fairly complex uh, 3D physics. So all of the physics that underpins the inversion schemes we'll discuss uh, is done in a full 3D sense, but I'll be using kind of uh, ball and stick uh, 2D diagrams to try and uh, int introduce those concepts in a more simple way. Most of the ideas that I'll show will be presented uh, visually, uh, but I, I would include some kind of uh, high fiber mathematics uh, for those of you who are interested in that kind of thing. So in introducing uh, seismic data, it's useful to discuss what we call the seismic experiment. So in this picture, we're going to consider a 2D uh, schematic of a section of the Earth's subsurface. Uh, so the y-axis here is the depth below sea level in kilometers. And the different colors on this picture essentially show the acoustic impedance uh, at the various uh, layers in the Earth's subsurface. So contrasts in that acoustic impedance correspond to different reflecting boundaries uh, in the subsurface of the Earth. So the acoustic impedance is related to the acoustic velocity or uh, wave speed V uh, by the density. Uh, but for most of this talk, I'll be kind of using impedance and velocity fairly interchangeably. So I won't necessarily draw a distinction uh, between the two. We also consider an acoustic source, which is typically an air gun, uh, and an array of acoustic receivers, we call those hydrophones. And essentially they measure pressure wave fields generated uh, by that acoustic source. Uh, so the seismic experiment looks something like this. We fire our air gun. That creates a pressure wave field which uh, travels down into the subsurface of the Earth uh, according to some uh, wave equation. And in the subsurface, it reflects and scatters off those reflecting boundaries. And that scattered wave field eventually makes its way back up to the surface and is recorded by these uh, receivers. So I'm going to play this movie again, but this time I'm also going to include on the right hand side an image of the pressure wave field uh, recorded at those receivers uh, over time. So we fire the source again, and on the right hand side we now see the recorded acoustic pressure uh, at each of those receiver locations along the x-axis, and the y-axis here is the recording time. So you can see that pressure wave field being generated or recorded uh, over, over time as that shot fires. So the map here, what we're seeing is a, is a map of the acoustic pressure. That pressure could be negative or positive, so that corresponds to rarefactions and compressions. So we're in the realm of essentially sound waves. So what we're doing here with a, these hydrophones is listening to the sound of these air bubbles that we fire into, uh, into the Earth's surface. So this is what we typically call a shot gather. This body of information here is called a shot gather. So this is a gather of individual uh, receiver uh, records uh, corresponding to a single common uh, shot firing, so one air gun firing. And this is the kind of raw unit of seismic data uh, that we typically use uh, in seismic processing. So acoustic sources and uh, receivers are typically deployed in marine environments. So normally they're attached to uh, boats and suspended in, in the ocean. And the boat kind of drags those uh, sources and receivers through the ocean as the seismic survey is conducted. So if I start this movie here and you focus on the middle of this, uh, pet, this three sets of uh, air guns, we can see that uh, air gun just firing there. We see the air bubble created as the shot fires. And we can also see that each of these uh, three pairs of air guns is attached by cables to the seismic uh, shooting vessel, which is this boat at the top here. So in a second, this movie will pan down. And when it does, we can see the wake of one, two, three, four, five of the previous firings of that particular air gun source corresponding to different seismic uh, experiments. So that's the acoustic sources. The acoustic receivers, the hydrophones, are typically contained in seismic streamers. So these are these yellow cables here. And these are attached again to the, uh, the back of the boat. So a typical kind of bird's eye schematic of a seismic acquisition vessel uh, looks something like this. So you have the boat up front, and then behind that, you have one or more uh, acoustic sources, those air guns. And then behind that, attached to a series of streamers, is the array of, uh, of hydrophone receivers. So to give you some idea of, of scale here of how big these structures are, this is that, uh, that uh, footprint uh, in comparison to, for example, the tallest building in the world. This is the, the Burj Khalifa um, or, the, or the Statue of Liberty. So significantly bigger than, than either of those two things. Um, in fact, this becomes even more impressive when you realize that this scale is actually logarithmic. Um, so if I were to plot these uh, sizes to scale on a proper linear scale, uh, then it would look something like this. So you can just about make out the Statue of Liberty uh, in the corner here. So this really gives you some sense of uh, how much uh, the uh, seismic footprint of this vessel dwarfs the, uh, these other kind of uh, big structures. 
So a seismic survey itself essentially consists of many, many of these seismic experiments, uh, these air gun firings over a large area of the ocean. Uh, that area can be as large as 40,000 square kilometers in the case of a, a, a very large survey. Uh, so to give you again some kind of context, uh, that's about twice the area of, uh, of Wales. It's about a thousand times the area of Cambridge, or if you prefer, it's about five million football pitches. So surveys of that size generate an awful lot of data uh, and you have to have somewhere to store that data. And if you want to do something with that data, uh, then you have to have the compute resources to back that up. So this is some of the hardware that we have uh, available at CGG. And in terms of uh, kind of global numbers uh, on this, we have around 270 petaflops of compute power and about 230 petabytes of storage. That's about 230,000 terabytes of storage. So this gives you some idea of the scale, not only of the acquisition uh, of the seismic data itself, but also the storage and processing of that data. So that's Seismic Data 101 out of the way. We're now going to discuss uh, the key concepts and applications uh, behind uh, inversion. So this is blood, brains, and brownies. So the general statement of the inverse problem is as follows. Uh, so given a known forward operator L and an observed data set D, find the model M such that D equals L of M. So that's a fairly simple uh, statement. Um, in plain English, we can say given a set of observations and a set of laws, both of which are known, uh, figure out the state M which leads to those observations. So you can look at this and say, well, we just need to find the inverse operator L to the minus one, and we're done, right? And, and unfortunately for the, uh, for the systems we'll be looking at, L to the minus one is either not easily found or it's in some sense unstable. So typically for an inversion problem, we'll work with the forward operator L and we'll solve for M uh, implicitly. So a typical kind of schematic for solving any kind of inversion problem looks something like this. So you start off with an initial guess for M, let's call it M tilde. You compute L of M tilde, remembering that L here is known. And then that gives you the notion of something called the residual, which we'll return to uh, throughout the presentation, which is the difference between the observed data D and the uh, modeled data L of M tilde. We then ask the question if that residual is less than some predefined uh, small threshold, Typically, the answer will be no, in which case we will update our guess for M uh, based on a function which is a function of that residual. Then we go back to the start with our updated guess for M and we try again. And we keep repeating that process, hopefully uh, repeating it in a sensible way in terms of our updates for M. Uh, and then we recover. Eventually, we come to a point where the residual is less than that predefined threshold. And then at that point, we say, well, our current guess for M tilde at this point is a good approximation to the true M. And we're done in terms of the inversion. So that's the general schematic uh, for solving an inversion problem. So a good analogy here is uh, is a brownie recipe. So let's suppose I give you a brownie recipe, but because I'm feeling kind of pathological today, I leave out some of the information. So, for example, I tell you what the brownie should look like, and that's D. I tell you what the ingredients are and how you can combine them. That's essentially the recipe, uh, so that's L. But what I haven't told you is the amounts of each ingredient. So assuming that you like inverse problems as well, then a good way to uh, proceed uh, with, uh, with your recipe is to essentially use the schematic that we have below. So you'll make an initial guess for what the ingredients look like. You'll follow the recipe. The result will probably be a fairly revolting mess, but then you can compare that to the image of the brownie that you have here, make some adjustments, hopefully based on common sense, and try again. And if you repeat that process a number of times, eventually you should reach uh, the perfect brownie. So in this inversion scheme, as with any inversion scheme, the important bit is how do we update our guess from one iteration uh, to the next? And we'll, uh, we'll discuss that in more detail uh, as we go through the presentation. A bit of history. So the idea of uh, kind of inferring cause from effect uh, is, is not new. So uh, one famous example from the 19th century is the prediction of the existence of Neptune. That was done independently by Adams and de Verrier. And that was based on observed perturbations of the orbit of Uranus. So based on the recorded data of that orbit and the predicted data uh, of that uh, orbit, um, it was inferred that uh, due to those perturbations, there must be a, a perturbing body between uh, Uranus and the Earth. And indeed, that was later confirmed to be, to be Neptune. So that was a dramatic uh, uh, confirmation of that prediction of a perturbing body. Early on in the 20th century, there was uh, an Armenian astrophysicist called Ambat Simeon who wrote a, a fairly um, uh, uh, kind of obscure paper on uh, whether or not we can infer the equations of vibrating strings from their eigenvalues. Uh, as I say, this was not particularly uh, heralded at the time, but is now seen as a, a kind of cornerstone in the development of, uh, of inversion throughout the 20th century. 
After World War II, the mechanics of inversion problems becomes a bit more formalized, and we start to see practical use of inversion becoming uh, more widespread. That takes us to today, where inversion problems are sufficiently important that they have their own IOP journal. So there's a journal called Inverse Problems. Uh, I've taken this description uh, from their website. Uh, they highlight applications not only in geophysics, but also in radar, optics, biology, acoustics, communication theory, signal processing and imaging, amongst others. So a huge variety of applications across a huge variety of different fields. Modern applications, so medical imaging is, is a big one. We'll return to this at the end of the talk. Um, uh, CAT scans. So CAT scans are, are, are based on an inversion technique where you essentially expose the human brain uh, to uh, X-ray radiation and you look at how that radiation is attenuated. And based on the observed attenuation pattern, you infer the structure of the brain which resulted uh, in that attenuation pattern. Uh, inversion is also used in forensics, so blood pattern analysis. So based on, on an observed uh, pattern of blood, you can infer things like the direction and force with which a blow was administered in order to generate uh, that, uh, that blood spatter. So we've talked a little bit about inversion, we've talked a little bit about seismic data. Now I want to bring those two uh, ideas together and discuss an inversion problem uh, in the context of seismic data, and we're going to talk about uh, eliminating ghosts. So I'll start off by explaining what a ghost is in the context of seismic data and why we want to remove it. So we're going to return to our uh, seismic experiment. Uh, in this 2D schematic, we have a source which fires, uh, the air gun fires and creates an incident wave field which travels down into the earth. Some scattering processes happen, and we may record, for example, uh, a scattered portion of the wave field at this receiver here. So we call this the primary wave field in the sense that it tells us what we want to know. It's the information that we want uh, from that recorded data, and it contains information about the subsurface of the earth. But we also record a lot of data that we don't want. Uh, so, so in particular, for example, this primary wave field, uh, as it reaches uh, the receiver and continues, it will continue up towards the sea surface. And at the sea surface, it will reflect again because the sea surface acts like a mirror and it will come down again. And effectively, a duplicate uh, recording will be recorded at this receiver here. And this is the what we call the receiver ghost. So the ghost wave field is a time delayed uh, polarity reversed copy, that polarity reversal due, being due to the, uh, the nature of the impedance contrast at the, at the surface, uh, and that's a copy of the primary wave field. And it arises because the sea surface acts a bit like a mirror, and that's due to that high impedance contrast. So it's important to realize that the ghost event is spurious in the sense that it doesn't really tell us anything uh, about the subsurface structure of the Earth. All it tells us about is the reflecting properties of the free surface, the sea surface, uh, that we're not really interested in. And in fact, it also contaminates the seismic image because those ghost events obscure the primary events that we are interested in. Primary and ghost wave fields also, in, also interact with each other and they create a constructive and destructive uh, interference pattern. That interference pattern looks uh, something like this. Uh, so this is a plot of amplitude against uh, frequency. And the red curve here is the combination of the primary and ghost wave fields. So you see this characteristic pattern of uh, peaks and troughs, or notches as we call them, uh, relating to that uh, interference. So that's what we have. What we want is this nice flat spectrum here, uh, which corresponds to the primary only wave field. So in particular, at these notch frequencies, we get complete cancellation of the primary and ghost wave field. So by removing the ghost from the seismic data via, as we'll see, via an inversion scheme, uh, we not only uh, reveal those obscured primary events, but we also restore uh, the lost signal uh, in these uh, in these notch frequencies here. So ghosts are not a phenomenon which are unique to seismic data. So if anybody watching is old enough to remember uh, analog television, uh, then some of you may be familiar with this kind of an image that you may have seen uh, on your analog TV set, where you get ghosting of your TV picture. Uh, so if you had a deghosting machine for your uh, uh, for your TV set, then your deghosted image might look something like that. Um, so this is our chameleon before and after deghosting. In fact, deghosting machines for TVs do indeed exist. This is an example of a ghost eliminator for your TV set. This was marketed in the, I think, the 1950s or 60s. Um, I don't think they were particularly useful. Um, they certainly weren't based on any kind of clever, clever uh, inversion scheme, uh, but this does at least illustrate that this was a real problem. This is what deghosting looks like on seismic data. Uh, so we're looking now at a vertical cross section. Uh, you can see the schematic of the boat here shooting and the, the water column beneath that. And then we're looking at the structure of the subsurface uh, beneath that. So this is seismic data as recorded with, with the ghost in there. So before deghosting and after deghosting. 
So as I toggle those two slides before and after deghosting, you can see that after deghosting, we've revealed uh, a much more simple and interpretable structure uh, than before deghosting. So in particular, where my mouse is, if I look at this uh, nice localized structure here, this has been obscured by its own ghost here uh, before the deghosting, which is nicely removed after the deghosting. Now, this result has been achieved using an inversion-based scheme. So this is a talk about inversion. So now let's talk about how we can encode deghosting as an inversion problem. So in the context of D equals L of M, in this uh, scenario, the recorded data here is the data that we record, the seismic data, which has the ghost in it. So that's what we have. What we want is M. What we want is the ghost-free data, and that's the unknown uh, to be found. So by construction, the only thing L can be in this scenario is a re-ghosting operator. In other words, it's an operator which takes a data set and adds its ghost back into it. So this introduces quite an important concept uh, for inversion, which is that the operator L uh, does the opposite of what, actually what we want to achieve in the first place. So here we're talking about de-ghosting. And in order to get de-ghosting working as an inversion problem, we need to define L as a re-ghosting operator. So let's just say that in words, what we're looking to do here is find a data set M such that when we add the ghost back into it, we recover uh, the recorded data D. And the reason for doing it this way is that defining a re-ghosting operator is actually much more straightforward than defining a de-ghosting operator. And that's why it's useful to describe de-ghosting as, uh, as an inverse problem. So let's have a look at how we can define a re-ghosting operator. So it turns out that to define a re-ghosting operator, we need to know what the ghost period is. So the ghost period is defined to be that time between the primary recording, uh, shown here, and the corresponding ghost recording, shown here. So in other words, it's the travel time corresponding to this layer here, this little triangle. It's the time spent above the receivers. Now, as it turns out, the ghost period itself is fixed for every arrival angle. So here in this schematic I've shown in this kind of ball and stick diagram, uh, I've shown a single arrival angle. And regardless of where that uh, ray path actually is recorded uh, by the receivers, for that same angle, the ghost period is the same. So I can consider a different arrival angle. So for example, this arrival angle, and that has a different ghost period. That's a slightly longer uh, ghost period uh, than the first arrival angle. But for a given, uh, for a given um, uh, arrival angle, uh, the ghost period is fixed. So it turns out that we can simplify the definition of a re-ghosting operator by working in a domain where the, de the, the data itself has been decomposed into its constituent arrival angles. So I'll spend the next few minutes talking uh, about how we can do that. So let's first of all consider uh, or return to the recorded shock gather that we saw at the start of this presentation. So if you recall, this is a, a series of pressure recordings the vertical axis here is uh, recording time, and the horizontal axis corresponds to the different uh, receiver locations. And we're looking at one firing of a single of a single air gun in this data set. So this data contains information relating to a multitude of different arrival angles from various different scattering processes uh, in the Earth. So my claim here is that we can use a transform called the linear radon transform, or the tau p transform, to decompose this data into its constituent uh, arrival angles. And this transform is defined as follows. So it's defined as the summation of the recorded data along predefined straight lines on the shot gather. So here's an example of a uh, straight line. Uh, so this particular choice of straight line uh, is defined by, like any other straight line, is defined by its y-intercept, which here we call tau, uh, and its gradient, which here we call uh, p. So the gradient of each line, my claim is, uh, corresponds to a fixed uh, arrival angle. Uh, so to see that, we can look at uh, just simple geometrical arguments and we can consider a plane wave at a fixed arrival angle and consider the wave front associated with that plane wave. And here is a bunch of receivers. And for a fixed angle theta, we can look at the time it takes for that wave front to reach each of these individual uh, receivers. And just through simple geometric arguments, we can see that that time is a linear function uh, of the receiver position x. So that demonstrates that the, uh, the different plane wave arrival angles relates to different straight lines on this uh, shot gather. So this is what the data looks like in the tau p domain, in the, in the radon domain. So each uh, the axes here relate to tau, the y-intercept of a particular line, and the x-axis relates to the gradient p of a particular line. So what that means is that each point in the radon domain corresponds to a summation along a single straight line in the, uh, in the shot gather domain. So for example, in particular, I can look at other examples of straight lines. So if I keep the y-intercept fixed and I vary the gradient, then I move across uh, in the radon domain. So that's a constant tau uh, and varying the p. 
or I can keep the uh, gradient fixed and move the Y intercept up and down. So that's now keeping the P fixed and varying the tau and I move down, uh, up and down in the radon domain. Now, as it turns out, we've, we've already seen that uh, to define uh, or to uh, encode a de-ghosting inversion problem, we need to think about a re-ghosting operator. So we've got used to kind of thinking about operators that do the opposite of what we want to achieve. And the same is true here. So um, actually to use a radon transform in our inversion scheme, we don't need to think about the forward radon transform. In other words, going from the panel on the left to the panel on the right. It turns out that what we would need to think about is actually the inverse radon transform. So the transform that goes from the panel on the right in the tau p domain to the panel on the left and uh, the shock gather domain. This is the expression for that, uh, that inverse radon transform. So this takes a data set A uh, in the radon domain and transforms it into a data set B uh, in the recorded data domain. Unfortunately, I don't really have time in this presentation to discuss uh, how this uh, operator was constructed, but I do have a few comments to make. Uh, in particular, you can see here that uh, we've uh, described this operator in terms of the temporal frequency uh, F. Uh, that's purely for convenience. It's, it's more easy to describe uh, this process uh, in the frequency domain rather than the time domain. And we'll see shortly in terms of the inversion, how we can basically incorporate that into the inversion scheme using temporal Fourier transforms. <clears throat> the other comment I would have is that um, in this uh, 2D picture here that I've shown on the slide, we're only considering gradients within the plane of the, of the page. In reality, this is a 3D transform, and we consider both gradients in the plane of the page, uh, but also perpendicular uh, to that page. So we're considering gradients in both X uh, and Y uh, directions. Let's just remind ourselves as to why we're doing this. The advantage, the point of doing all of this is that the ghost period is fixed for a given arrival angle. And that simplifies the mechanics of the re-ghosting operator inside the inversion. So for all data along this blue line, all of that data corresponds to a fixed uh, arrival angle. And so I can treat every point on that line the same way in terms of the re-ghosting. So let's put all of that together and look at our inversion problem uh, for a uh, de-ghosting operation. So the aim here is to find the data set M such that when we apply a re-ghosting operator in the tau p domain, and I'll define what the re-ghosting operator looks like uh, shortly, and then apply an inverse radon transform to go from tau p to the recorded data domain, we recover something which looks like the recorded data uh, D. Now, I've already mentioned in passing that uh, the H uh, operator, the inverse rate on transform, makes use of the temporal frequency rather than describing things in terms of the time uh, T. Uh, so strictly speaking, the same is also true of the G operator. So for completeness, we should actually wrap these two operators inside a forward and reverse temporal Fourier transform. So this gives us the whole uh, uh, kind of uh, totality of the operator uh, for the degaussian problem. So in terms of the original description of the inversion equation, we can think of this combination of four operators as being our L operator. So again, uh, F, G, and H, they're all linear operators. They can all be represented essentially as matrices. And the product of any linear operator is also another linear operator. So in this, uh, in this system, L here is a linear operator or a matrix. Just to kind of put the uh, the bells and whistles on what the re-ghosting operator itself looks like in the radon domain, uh, this is the definition of the re-ghosting operator uh, in the radon domain. So this takes a data set C in the radon domain and re-ghosts it to produce another data set also in the radon domain uh, called A. So again, I don't really have time to kind of go into the details of why it looks like this, but just to kind of uh, put a few comments on that. The Z uh, component here relates to the depth of the receiver. Uh, the fact that the reflection coefficient at the C surface is about minus one, uh, that's represented by this negative sign here. And these different signs on the exponents uh, relate to the relative timings of the primary and the ghost. This is just uh, repeating the inverse radon transform. So we've already seen that uh, in the previous slide. And then just some general comments on this. So as I've already said, L is a linear operator. So this is a linear system. So in principle, at least, we can just invert for this linear system by inverting the matrix L. However, in reality, this matrix is far too big to solve for M uh, directly. So M typically comprises something of the order of a million or so unknowns. Uh, so we need to employ fairly efficient uh, iterative numerical solvers uh, to solve this linear system. And these iterative numerical solvers are exactly analogous to that process that we've described at the start of the presentation in terms of guessing and updating our inversion scheme. So those iterative solvers are based on well-defined processes of guessing and updating. So one famous example of a linear solver is gradient descent or steepest descent, which you may be familiar with. And indeed, we'll talk about gradient descent in detail in the next section. 
Uh, but for this particular problem, we find um, a, an alternative method to, uh, called the conjugate gradient method typically converges uh, more quickly. So I'll, I'll wrap up this section with uh, another example of uh, deghosting on, on real data. And in this section, um, so I show here two, um, uh, well, I show one vertical cross section, but two different uh, bands. Uh, so on the left hand side, we see the full bandwidth display of the vertical cross section. Uh, we see the various different uh, seismic events there corresponding to the different reflecting layers. And on the right hand side, we see the same data, but this time band limited so that I've selected only those frequencies uh, in the region of one of these uh, notches or troughs where we get destructive interference uh, between the primary and the ghost wave field. So the purpose of doing that is to show you what happens uh, on the full bandwidth display and on the band limited display as we apply the deghosting. So before deghosting and after deghosting looks something like this. So this result has been achieved uh, using our inversion scheme that we just described. So this is before and after deghosting. And on the full bandwidth display, we see those that ghost energy being removed. And overall, the amount of energy uh, seen by the eye uh, goes down on that full bandwidth display. But what's interesting is that when we look at the band limited display before and after deghosting, actually the energy in that particular bandwidth goes up. And that's a, that's a consequence of us restoring the energy uh, in that trough as a result of removing the ghost. OK, so to summarize linear inversion, then linear inversion essentially involves solving a large linear system using an iterative numerical solver. So one thing we haven't really touched upon, but which will become important uh, in the next section, is that typically exact solutions uh, aren't really possible. And sometimes exact solutions aren't even desirable. It's useful to have an inexact solution. So we typically solve in a least square sense. So normally when we do an inversion scheme, uh, we will be focusing on something like this, uh, where we identify this norm squared of D minus LM as the cost function. And the, the objective of the inversion is to minimize that cost function uh, in a least square sense. We've used deghosting here as an example of how linear inversion can be used to remove unwanted noise from seismic data. And in the following section, we'll show how inversion can be used in a much more powerful and general sense uh, to generate images of the subsurface uh, and model rock properties. So a lot of the ideas that we've introduced in this section, things like iterative solvers, forward operators, etc., they're all still going to apply, uh, but the mechanics becomes a little bit more complicated uh, as we move to nonlinear inversion. Okay. So now we're going to take a look at a much more powerful and general form of inversion. Uh, so we're going to look at an example of nonlinear inversion, and that's full waveform inversion, or FWI. So the goal of full waveform inversion, the goal of FWI, is to invert for a model of subsurface properties which minimizes the difference between a recorded seismic data set and a data set predicted by the model, and that's via a wave equation. So to illustrate that, I'll return to the movie I showed at the start of the presentation, where we have the seismic experiment uh, showing the wave field propagation, a pressure wave field through the Earth, and the corresponding recorded seismic uh, data set that we, that we acquire over time. Of the full waveform inversion, if we call this data set on the right hand side D, this is what we have, our observed data, and the model of the subsurface, uh, uh, for example, a model of impedance or a model of velocity, etc. If we call that M, this is the unknown, the question posed by full waveform inversion is can we find M from D? So let's put that in the context of D equals LM. So L here is an operator which propagates a seismic wave field based on some kind of wave equation. Uh, and that's based on a candidate uh, set of model parameters, M tilde. So those, that model would describe, for example, the velocity or the density or the impedance uh, in the Earth. And based on that uh, forward modeling, we generate a candidate data set, D tilde, which we can then pair with the observed data, D. And that's what drives the, uh, the inversion scheme. So the history of, of FWI goes back to the 1960s. So John Clairbout wrote a paper in 1968, which kind of discussed the, the basic principles uh, of FWI. But it wasn't until uh, the 1980s that there was a real kind of mathematical formalism uh, developed. That was done by uh, Tarantola and Mora in the 80s. But even then, there were a huge number of kind of practical limitations and difficulties associated with that workflow that meant that running full waveform inversion didn't really become practical uh, until the early 21st century. And that was thanks to advances in uh, computing power, also kind of different strategies uh, for the inversion itself. That takes us to today where we're seeing uh, FWI being applied with enormous success in increasingly sophisticated forms. It's a hugely active area of research and almost on a month by month basis. Uh, we're getting uh, more and more impressive results uh, from FWI. 
FWI can be formulated to model a variety of properties associated with the subsurface. Um, so that includes things like uh, velocity, so that's the acoustic uh, compressional wave speed in the various layers of the subsurface, uh, but also density, uh, elasticity, viscosity, which is something we'll touch on uh, later in the talk, uh, and also things like anisotropy, that's the directional dependence of the wave speed uh, in the subsurface. So the more of these effects that we incorporate into our inversion engine, the, the, the better the physics is, but that also increases the complexity of the inversion and the associated computational costs. So historically and used currently, uh, FWI is an enormously expensive uh, and costly process to run uh, in, in a full 3D sense. So for this talk, we'll derive uh, an FWI engine uh, to in for velocity, subsurface velocity, in the simplest case, of the uh, isotropic wave equation. So that's the equation that I've found at the bottom of the slide here. And in this context, V here is the velocity we're trying to invert for. Uh, rho is the density. Uh, P is the acoustic pressure wave field. And that pressure wave field is generated by our external force S, which in this case is our seismic source. This is a linear equation in the sense that this uh, operate big brackets can be expressed as a matrix A. Uh, so from, the, from this point forward, when I talk about the wave equation, I'll basically be discussing this equation, uh, AP equals S. So this is just your operator. Before I kind of dig into the details of how inversion works, I'd like to spend just one or two minutes discussing what's useful to know the velocity in the first place and what the point of doing the full waveform inversion is. So one reason is, is as follows. So let's consider a, a co-located source and receiver uh, in a seismic experiment. Uh, operating in a constant velocity medium, and let's assume that that velocity is known, uh, and we have one reflecting boundary uh, shown by this uh, orange line here. So as the acoustic source fires, fires isotropically in all directions, but because we only have one receiver in this particular test, the thing that we record is basically the normal incidence uh, reflection. Uh, so the uh, actual recording of the seismic data in this case corresponds to an event at a particular two-way travel time t equals 2L over V, uh, for the ray path hitting the roof uh, at normal incidence. Now, one of the goals of seismic imaging uh, is to be able to tell exactly where those reflectors are in the subsurface. And if this was the only experiment we had, uh, we'd be a bit stuffed in terms of working out where that reflector is, because that two-way travel time that we record only defines a locus of possible reflector locations. So based on that travel time, the reflecting point could be anywhere on this locus of, of points here. In reality, though, the thing, the thing that saves us is that we conduct a great many seismic experiments like this, each of which has their own locus of points. And by summing together all of these loci, uh, we effectively, uh, through a, a pattern of constructive and destructive interference, we effectively create an envelope revealing the location uh, of the true reflector. So this envelope would look something like this. That just happens naturally as a result of summing uh, those loci. Now, so this, this, what we've just done here is an example of migration. So it's a critical step uh, in generating accurate images of the subsurface. So this process of creating the loci and summing them up to determine the correct uh, reflector positions is what we call migration. So to migrate data accurately, we need to know what V is. So here we've assumed that we know what V is. And perhaps we need to know some other things as well, and I'll discuss more about that uh, later. Now, in the real world, V is not only uh, not, it's also not constant. Uh, so it can vary considerably. Uh, even over short distances. So knowing what the subsurface velocity is in the Earth is critical uh, to achieving a good migration result and therefore a good subsurface image. So what does FWI look uh, as an inversion scheme? Well, it looks like any other inversion scheme. We start off with uh, a guess, an initial guess for the model. In this case, the model is a subsurface model of uh, velocity. Based on that initial guess, we generate some forward model data. So this is our L of M. That's a, in this case would be a, a, a common shot gather. So that's an example of the type of data we've seen uh, earlier in the presentation. And we then compare that model data with the corresponding uh, recorded data. And based on the difference between them, uh, that gets us uh, a residual so that we've already discussed the notion of a residual. That residual is also can be used as we'll see uh, to define a cost function. So we mentioned cost functions briefly at the end of the last section. And ultimately that residual is going to be used to update uh, the model uh, guess for the next iteration. So there's a little bit of a, a kind of um, a black box here, which I'll talk about uh, shortly, but ultimately we're going to use that residual to calculate a gradient-based update scheme. So this is a kind of gradient-style scheme where we calculate the gradient of the cost function and use that in order to update the model from one iteration uh, to the next. So this process is, iterati is iterated as with all and when we iterate, 
that subsurface model will evolve a number of iterations uh, according to that, cal that uh, calculation of the gradient and eventually converging to uh, an accurate representation of what the velocity in the subsurface actually looks like. So after a number of iterations, your model will look something like this, and that's the model which minimizes uh, the difference between the model data and the recorded data. So obviously the elephant in the room here is how we go from the visual or the cost function uh, to, this, to this gradient. So I'll spend the next few slides discussing how we calculate the gradient of the cost function in order to date uh, this, uh, this model. So we're going to describe FWI as an iterative inversion scheme based on a gradient descent method. So the pressure wave field P and the source S are connected by a linear operator. So we've already seen that. That's just the wave equation. However, the goal here is to invert for a subsurface M, and the relationship between the model M and P is actually nonlinear. So that makes this whole inversion scheme uh, nonlinear. Use uh, the techniques that we derived uh, in the section. In general, what we're seeking to do here is minimize the difference between the recorded data D and the model data W. And we seek to minimize the following uh, L2 cost function. So this cost function J, which is defined as the inner product of the residual, which is just D minus W, uh, with itself. Uh, so if we denote the residual uh, D minus W as delta, D, then the cost function J is the inner product of delta D with itself. So I've used the kind of angular bracket notation here for inner products, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with from, uh, from quantum theory. So this naturally encodes uh, the notion of an integration in this inner product space, uh, and that enter here is done uh, over time. So because we're seeking to move this cost function, we want to uh, differentiate it. And in particular, we're seeking to minimize this cost function with respect to changes in the model. So what we want to find is the gradient of J with respect to a particular model parameter, uh, M sub I. So by particular model parameter here, I mean uh, it could be velocity, for example, or it could be density or elasticity or viscosity, basically all of the components that go describing the structure of the subsurface. So here we'll focus on deriving an equation for the gradient of J with respect to the velocity. So the next few slides are going to be a bit sort of abstract in terms of the maths. Um, so uh, I hope I don't lose you, but if I do, don't worry. I'll come back in a few slides time and try and draw all this together in a more pictorial way. But the objective for the next few slides is to derive a useful expression uh, for the gradient of the objective function with respect to changes in the, uh, in the, in the model parameter. So we want to calculate J by dm. Uh, and the first, uh, the first way of doing that is simply to do that based on the explicit uh, definition of what J is. So we take this inner product definition, and when we differentiate with respect to M sub I, just based on the chain rule, we recover this, uh, this expression here. So again, I've used the same angular bracket notation uh, to denote uh, the inner product. But we can also apply that same uh, operator, that same differential operator, to the wave equation itself. And if we do that, when we apply that differential operator to the wave equation, uh, this is what we recover. And if we rearrange this expression, we can make uh, dw by dm the subject of this expression, and this is what we get. I should point out here that I've also introduced a uh, what's called a sampling operator k. Uh, so k here is the operator which connects the wave field p, the modeled wave field p, uh, with the modeled uh, recorded data uh, w. So uh, we basically obtain the modeled data by sampling the modeled wave field at the individual receiver locations. So k is just a sampling uh, operator connecting those two things. The next step is then to sub in our expression uh, derived in equation two into equation one up here, and we recover this expression uh, for dj by dm. So that's based on just substitution. Uh, I've also used some of the properties of, uh, of Hermitian adjoints, which is kind of, again, implicitly defined inside this inner product. So I, I basically moved this uh, a to the minus one operator to the right hand side of the, uh, of the inner product space. And in so doing, I need to take the, uh, the Hermitian adjoint of that. So I can put a little bit more context into this and a bit more interpretation on this uh, by looking in a bit more detail uh, at this uh, structure on the right. So I'm going to define this, uh, this product, a to the minus one dagger acting on delta d. I'm going to call that r, and then I'm going to look at what the, um, the ramifications are uh, of looking at this, uh, at this structure. Well, I'll just repeat that up here. So r is defined to be a to the minus one dagger acting on d. Just rearranging that, uh, we get the following expression. Uh, so a dagger acting on r uh, equals delta d. So let's just take a step back here and, and look at what we're dealing with here. And to help uh, assess what we're dealing with, I'm going to just repeat at the bottom here the normal form of the dimensional uh, acoustic wave equation. So the acoustic wave equation, as we've already seen, can be written as AP equals S. 
So this describes a conventional wave equation propagating forwards in time. Now, actually, when you compare these two things, top and bottom, uh, there are some similarities here. So we have an adjoint operator A here, instead of uh, a dagger, instead of the operator A. But other than that, there, there are analogies between P and R and S and delta D. So essentially what we're looking at here is the adjoint form of the wave equation where delta D corresponds to a virtual source instead of the actual source S. And the wave field P is replaced by the, the adjoint wave field R. And the adjoint operator on the A simply means that we reverse the direction uh, in time. So what we're looking at here in the adjoint wave equation is the description of a reverse propagated wave field in time uh, due to a virtual source uh, delta D. So don't worry if you're kind of starting to lose the thread at this point. I'll try and put this back together again uh, in a few minutes. So if I sub in my expression for R in, back into my previous expression uh, for the gradient, this is my final expression, uh, my final general expression uh, for the gradient that we're going to use to update uh, our velocity models. So that's based just on subbing uh, equation four into equation three from the previous slide. Now, this equation uh, in the middle here is, uh, is true for any model parameter. Here, we're interested in the particular case where the model parameter is the velocity, because we want to update the velocity model. So if we say, if we say let mi equal v, then we can calculate, uh, just based on differentiating the wave equation, we can calculate dA by dV, and that turns out to be this uh, operator here. Again, that's just from the wave equation. And we can then uh, sub in that special case into this general case here to obtain the final expression for the gradient uh, in the case of uh, velocity model updates. So this gradient here is the gradient descent uh, describing the FWI engine. So let's put all that back into the picture that we showed before uh, of the FWI inversion scheme and see if we can make a bit of sense uh, of it. Uh, so we, we said previously that the, the elephant in the room here is how we go from the residual uh, to the gradient of the cost function. And now we can put a bit of flesh on that and say, well, the residual, that's just delta D. And I obtain uh, the gradient ultimately by first calculating uh, R by back propagating this virtual source delta D backwards in time according to the uh, adjoint form of the wave equation. Once I've got R, I can then uh, put that into this expression to calculate uh, the gradient. So let's have a look at that pictorially to give you a better feel for what's going on. So this is what FWI actually looks like. So the first step is to take our uh, seismic source and inject it uh, at the source location and propagate it down into the earth based on the wave equation. So we inject the source S and we create the forward propagated wave field P. We sample, using our K uh, sampling operator, we sample that uh, forward wave field at the receiver location to obtain the model data, W. And then by comparing W and the recorded data, we can compute the residual uh, delta D. That residual then forms the base of the virtual source uh, for our adjoint wave equation. So that residual is then injected at the receiver location back propagated in time uh, back to the uh, back to the source location. So we're injecting delta D here as a virtual source and back propagating to create the uh, back propagated wave field R. And then based purely on this uh, expression for the gradient, we can then cross correlate or uh, form the inner product of those two wave fields P and R and use that to update uh, the model. So that's FWI in theory. Let's have a look at FWI in action. So this is a 2D synthetic example. Uh, so in this synthetic example, we have the benefit of a ground truth model to benchmark uh, our results against. Uh, on the top here, we see a starting model uh, for FWI. So this movie, we'll see the evolution of uh, FWI uh, from the starting model through the various iterations uh, towards its final model. You can see it's slowly starting to resemble the ground truth model that we have at the bottom. And then after a certain number of iterations, we get a very nice representation uh, of this ground truth model. Of course, that ground truth model isn't available to the FWI engine. Uh, it's, uh, it's blind in that respect. That was a synthetic example on 2D data. Let's take a look at FWI in action now on real 3D field data. Um, so what you're seeing here on the left-hand side of, this, of the display is three different horizontal cross sections uh, corresponding to different uh, depth slices uh, in the subsurface uh, of the Earth. And I'm showing actually sets of results here because I'm showing uh, a, a velocity model, uh, which is the uh, kind of colored uh, um, overlay, and the black and white or the grayscale representation is actually the seismic data underneath that. Uh, so, what, so it's essentially like this uh, pictorial representation here. 
So what we're seeing here is the results from a historical velocity model that isn't based on uh, FWI. And it's a fairly benign looking velocity model. It doesn't really change uh, laterally. It changes from depth slice to, de to depth slice, but it's not a particularly interesting or um, uh, exciting looking velocity field. So if we compare that to the result from FWI, this is the resulting velocity field uh, obtained from FWI. So first of all, we notice uh, significant differences between the historical velocity model and the FWI velocity model, so that's one thing. But perhaps more impressively, we see a very strong correlation between the uh, structures in uh, the actual seismic data and the corresponding contrasts in uh, velocity uh, in the FWI result. So again, FWI doesn't know about uh, these uh, structures in the seismic data. It's purely based on the inversion. It's come up with the fact that the, the velocity uh, in these different regions uh, should be different. So there's an excellent agreement here between contrast in the velocity model and the details of the subsurface structure. So this gives us an, an enormous amount of confidence uh, that FWI uh, is working very well here. So, so far for FWI, we've considered the simplest case of inverting for velocity in an acoustic isotropic uh, medium. I've kind of mentioned in passing that we can incorporate other properties such as elasticity, uh, anisotropy, viscosity, and so on, uh, but that can all be done at the cost of complicating the mechanics of the inversion. Nevertheless, I think it's, it's beneficial to look at how we do that. Uh, so to illustrate the principle of extending FWI, I'll now consider adding a different element into the mix, and we'll take a look at viscosity. So a few words on what viscosity is. Uh, so the energy associated with a wave field as it travels through a viscous medium, uh, like the Earth, uh, is gradually absorbed by that medium and converted to heat. Uh, so effectively what we're talking about here is friction or anelastic attenuation. So that process uh, is defined by the quality factor Q, uh, which is a dimensionless quantity characterizing the attenuating properties of a given uh, medium. So Q is normally defined in terms of the fractional energy loss uh, per cycle uh, of the wave field, and a low Q number corresponds to a high energy loss, and uh, correspondingly, a high Q number corresponds to a relatively low level of energy loss. Q values are typically associated with dissipation functions, and the dissipation function tells you how that energy is transmitted to the Earth uh, as the seismic wave field passes through it. So that dissipation function has an amplitude attenuation term and also a phase of amplification. So to show you what that looks like on, on actual seismic data, here's an example of a vertical cross-section which has been modeled uh, using a synthetic model. And in this case, we've modeled this without the effects of viscosity in there, so we've ignored viscosity. So these various uh, layers of the uh, subsurface define the reflectors. But if we look at the same uh, model data, but this time incorporating viscosity according to this dissipation function, uh, we uh, result here. So if I toggle between those, that's no viscosity and with viscosity, we see that the example with the viscosity is firstly weak because of the amplitude attenuation, but it's also shifted in, in time, and that's due to that phase modification associated with uh, the viscous nature of the absorption. So the overall effect here is both attenuating and dispersive. So dispersive simply means it's a function which varies with frequency. And typically the effects of viscosity and velocity are coupled. Uh, so when we incorporate viscosity into our FWI, we normally consider uh, velocity at the same time. And just as with a velocity, uh, you have the notion of a field where every point in the subsurface has a velocity associated with it, every point in the subsurface also can be thought of as having a viscosity or a key value associated with it. So we, we have the notion of a Q field in the subsurface, and that field typically comprises a slowly varying background trend in combination with uh, often uh, significant and quite localized variations in Q, and that's due to specific kind of highly absorbing uh, geological features uh, like gas clouds and uh, mud sections and so on, and we call those things Q bodies. But just to state a few results in terms of FWI and how it differs in the acoustic world that we've just left behind and the viscoacoustic world that we're now looking at, um, just to refresh your memory, I've included at the top right here the expression for the FWI gradient for any model parameter uh, that we defined or derived in the last uh, section. And for convenience, I've also defined this gamma term to be equal to 1 over pi q. So let's look, first of all, at the wave equation. So in the acoustic world, the wave equation looks something like this. This is essentially the form that we've already seen for the wave equation. Um, I've, here I've represented it for convenience in terms of the frequency domain. Uh, so we replace the uh, d by dt, the partial derivative, with respect to time. That gets replaced in the frequency domain with this i omega term. 
The corresponding wave equation in the viscoacoustic case is given by this slightly more complicated looking expression. Uh, but in the limit as gamma tends to zero, that's the, uh, in the limit as we uh, ignore the viscosity, we indeed recover uh, the uh, classical form of the acoustic wave equation. We can differentiate the equations to derive the essential ingredients of the gradient with respect to velocity. Uh, so again, on the left-hand side, this is just expressing dA by dV, um, uh, basically an expression that we've already found in the, in the last section. And if we do the same uh, derivative on the right-hand side with the viscoacoustic wave equation, we get this, again, slightly more complicated expression, but in the limit as gamma tends to zero, we recover the gradient uh, for velocity in the acoustic case. But what's interesting about the viscoacoustic world is that we can also ask the question, what does the gradient with respect to viscosity look like? So here, by looking at potentially updating our viscosity model uh, through FWI, and to do that, uh, we need the gradient with respect to viscosity. So again, this is obtained simply by differentiating this wave equation, but this time with respect to gamma. This is a considerably more complicated looking beast, but fundamentally it comes from the same uh, ideas uh, as before. So if we differentiate that wave equation with respect to gamma, this is ultimately what we, uh, what we obtain. So this gradient that can then be used uh, to update our viscosity model uh, in, in FWI to get a better model of the cube or the, the, the viscosity field. Here's an example of using FWI on real data to invert for that Q field. Uh, so this is a, a, a large survey, a 36,000 square kilometre survey. Uh, so this is one of our surveys that's twice the size of, of Wales. And again, I've, uh, I've got this dual display where I overlay the, uh, the uh, model, in this case a Q model, uh, in, in the colour display uh, over the grayscale, which is the seismic data itself. So you can see what I was talking about earlier when I, look, when I describe the kind of the general background uh, of the Q field. Uh, so for large sections of this, uh, of this survey, and uh, this horizontal cross section, the Q field doesn't really change that much, it's fairly benign. But there's a section through here where we get these strong variations in Q, and that corresponds to highly absorbing geo bodies uh, in the subsurface of the Earth. This can be quite localized, so I can, I've got a, a zoom section here, which I've blown up on the right-hand side, to show some quite localized Q bodies. And again, we can see that when we look at the, uh, the map of uh, inverted Q values, very well tied to the underlying uh, uh, and contrasts in the seismic image itself. This is a vertical cross section of the same area. So where this dotted line is, that defines the position of the vertical cross section. And in here, we can count one, two, three, four uh, areas of Q bodies, highly absorbing Q bodies, uh, and the corresponding um, uh, anomalous nature of the Q field that's been uh, obtained from FWI. So again, a very good correlation here between the, the seismic data itself and the results from FWI. One of the reasons for doing uh, QFWI or incorporating Q into the FWI is the same reason as before for velocity. It's to get a better uh, migrated image. So you'll recall uh, that migrated images need a good uh, definition or a good understanding of velocity. They also require a good understanding uh, of the Q field, particularly in, in regions where the Q is strongly varying. So here's an example of two different vertical cross sections. Um, uh, so this is uh, migrated images using this process that we described earlier of, uh, of summing those loci of uh, possible uh, perfected depths. This is the migrated image then based on a constant key field. And you can see in this image, there are a couple of, so here, for example, where my mouse, my, my mouse pointer is, and here, these relate to um, uh, strongly absorbing Q bodies in the subsurface. And you can see that beneath those Q bodies, the reflectors kind of lose resolution. They, they're kind of dropping down in terms of amplitude. And also the, the depth thing is, is wrong. So we kind of, they kind of dip down in this bowl shape underneath that, uh, that uh, uh, Q body. And that's because here we've assumed a constant Q field rather than an FWI Q field uh, in the migration. If instead we repeat this migration using an FWI derived Q field, uh, then we correct uh, the depth thing of those reflectors. So you can see now through here, these reflectors are much more continuous and believable. And we also bring back some of that amplitude loss uh, that we had from the, the effects of viscosity. Okay, so we've seen how FWI can be used to develop um, models of velocity, of viscosity, and potentially a number of other things as well. But FWI remains a, a hugely active area of research. So I'd like to spend a few minutes now at the end just talking about what's next uh, for FWI. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, FWI imaging. So this is really what the future holds uh, for FWI. So one of the main goals of seismic processing is to obtain an accurate picture of subsurface reflectors. And in order to do that, we need to image those reflectors with both high resolution and a, a, at the correct location. So we essentially need to know where those reflectors are uh, in the subsurface to get a good image of that subsurface. 
So we've already seen in the previous slides that migration is one way of doing that. Uh, so if you recall, again, migration is this technique of um, summing together all possible reflector locations in such a way that the envelope that's revealed by that summation uh, defines the actual location of the reflector. And migration as a process works directly with the recorded data and uses a supplied velocity model. And that supplied velocity model could be based on, for example, FWI or any other, any, any other technique. However, in principle, we can drop the migration process completely and obtain an image of the subsurface directly from the FWI model itself. So we've already seen that FWI can essentially give us an image of the velocity or an image of the density. Now what we're asking is, can FWI get us an image of effectively the reflection coefficients? Because an image of the reflection coefficients is basically a picture of the, of the subsurface. And it turns out, yes, we can. We can use FWI for that. And that's based on this expression for uh, reflectivity and how it relates to impedance contrast uh, across an interface. So here I'm going to use impedance and velocity fairly interchangeably again. We know that we can invert for velocity. And then based on this expression, uh, we can essentially differentiate that field uh, to obtain uh, a model of the reflectivity, missing out the migration process uh, entirely. So the actual ideas here involved aren't particularly new. It's essentially just taking existing FWI and pushing it to more uh, to, to greater extremes. And one extreme that we're looking at here is, is maximum temporal frequency. So a major limiting factor in terms of computational cost uh, is the maximum temporal frequency that you consider in the recorded data when you're running FWI, because the computational cost increases very significantly as soon as you start to increase that maximum temporal frequency. So, if, if so far, we've looked at FWI as a means for driving a migration algorithm. In other words, we use FWI to come up with a velocity model, for example, which can then be supplied to a migration algorithm in order to produce a high-resolution image of the subsurface. And in that case, the thing that we need the FWI for is essentially just to get the reflector positioning, to get the velocities good enough that we put the reflectors in the right place. The actual image resolution in the final image of the subsurface, that comes from the migration. So in this context, it's only necessary to invert uh, using FWI for a velocity model up to about 10 hertz of the, uh, of the recorded seismic data. And that's considerably cheaper in a computational sense than going to much higher frequencies. Now what we're doing is proposing to use FWI for imaging directly. And if we do that, we drop the migration process completely. And in so doing, we now rely on FWI to get us both the reflector positioning and the image resolution. So in that case, we need to invert up to much, much higher frequencies than before. So typically of the order of 100 hertz or so. So we can demonstrate the power of this high resolution velocity model, which would be suitable for FWI imaging, versus this low resolution model, which is a model suitable for migration, simply by taking the, the vertical derivative uh, of these two models. And when we do that, we really highlight the impact of the high resolution uh, of, the, of the velocity model uh, going up to 100 hertz versus that going up to 10 hertz. So, um, if we want to use an FWI imaging product directly for imaging, um, then we have to go up to these very high frequencies. Now, obviously, we have to justify uh, this process because there's a significant increase in cost to doing this. And the way we justify this uh, is as follows. So, in theory, FWI imaging can potentially uh, outperform migration as the method for generating reflectivity models. And one reason for that uh, is that the least squares nature of the inversion process actually tends to minimize the impact of uh, noise and undesirable components in the recorded data on the final result. And it tends to provide a much more stable response, uh, particularly at low frequencies. So we'll see an example of that on real data in the following slides. So this is data taken from uh, offshore Norway. So on the left-hand side, we have a high-resolution um, vertical section of an FWI velocity model. And on the right-hand side, we see the corresponding uh, image uh, generated from a migration algorithm. So this image showing uh, the various positions of the reflectors in the subsurface and so on. So what I'm going to do now is compare the image on the right-hand side, which has been obtained using conventional imaging, with the FI imaging uh, result. So if I toggle these two, this is conventional imaging on the right and FWI imaging on the right. We can see that with the FWI imaging, there are a number of benefits. So in particular, the reflectors are better defined. They're more continuous through here, for example. There's less noise, less low frequency noise in particular, and overall the image is, is much better. In fact, this, this difference becomes much more stark when we look at horizontal cross sections uh, through the same, uh, this same data set. So on this slide, I show two different horizontal cross sections at uh, two different depths. So on the left-hand side, we have one depth which is close to the seabed, and on the right-hand side, we go a little deeper. 
I've also shown zoom sections uh, of a small piece of each of these uh, depth slices. So this result that we see on this slide has been obtained from conventional imaging. And this result is what we get from FWI imaging. And I've worked at CGG for, for 10 years, and these are some of the most impressive images uh, I've seen. I, it's, it's staggering to me that an inversion can be so good as to produce such a, an incredible looking result. So when we look at the uh, conventional imaging versus the FWI imaging, it really is night and day in terms of the, the resolution of this, of this image. So we see these rock faults through here, for example, which are barely visible on the conventional image, very nicely defined on the FWI image. We also see, I don't know if you can make out on the top right hand side here, where my mouse pointer is, uh, we can see um, near the seabed, we see this scarring on the on the water bottom that's caused by um, uh, iceberg scours on the water bottom, again, barely visible in the uh, in the conventional imaging result. So this really is a stunning uh, verification of the power uh, of inversion. So just wrapping up FWI then, FWI is a nonlinear inversion scheme for obtaining high resolution models of subsurface properties. With FWI in principle, we can invert for properties like velocity, density, viscosity, elasticity, and anisotropy. We've seen that FWI models can be used to drive other algorithms like migration, for example, or more powerfully, they can be used as images uh, in themselves. And FWI continues to be enormously successful throughout geophysics, and as we'll see uh, now in the, in the final section of the talk, uh, also has applications uh, further afield. So just in the last few minutes, I'd like to very briefly look at how we can use FWI uh, beyond the seismic realm. And we're going to return to medical imaging. So we've already seen at the start of the presentation uh, how CAT scans are an example of uh, inversion-based uh, medical imaging. Uh, the alternative to CAT scans these days is uh, MRI imaging or magnetic resonance imaging. Um, both of these have their own uh, have their own drawbacks. So CAT scans in particular, they involve exposure to harmful X-ray radiation, uh, MRI machines, they're quite impractical, they're, they're, they're bulky, they're not very portable, um, and uh, you can have problems if you have patients who are claustrophobic and so on. So the uh, the aim here is to come up with something which avoids both of these uh, drawbacks. What I'm going to show you is some results, uh, not from CGG, but from a research group based at Imperial College, um, who have effectively done FWI uh, on the human brain. Uh, so to do this, what they have is a helmet of uh, ultrasound transducers. You can see the schematic here of the helmet, and they act as both source and receivers simultaneously. And what they're doing here is to invert for acoustic wave speed in the brain. So they're doing exactly what we've just done uh, in, uh, in the subsurface of the earth, but these guys are doing it inside the, inside the human brain. So here's a picture of a seismic field or an acoustic wave field traveling through uh, the human brain, and you can see it reflecting off the reflecting boundaries in the brain and so on and so forth. So this is reminiscent of the uh, image of wavefield propagation that I showed at the start of this presentation, uh, showing the wavefield propagation through the Earth. It's the same thing. It's, it's an acoustic wave uh, past uh, a, a scattering medium. It's just that the difference is on the left, uh, we're doing things in the, in the subsurface of the Earth. On the right-hand side, we're doing things in the subsurface of the human brain. So I'll show the FWI results obtained uh, by this research group. And I'm going to show this as a movie, just to explain what you're about to see. We have three different uh, axes that we can view the brain through. So we have the transverse, sagittal, and coronal axes. And the columns here represent, the first left represents the true uh, benchmark result, showing the actual image of the brain. The middle column shows the starting model for FWI, and the right-hand column shows the FWI result uh, after a certain number of iterations. So as I start these movies, see that as we compare the first column and the third column, uh, effective FWI is, even on this very small scale, uh, imaging uh, correctly uh, the various layers, the reflecting layers uh, inside the brain. So this is a portable and safe technology. It involves no exposure to harmful radiation. Uh, one of the benefits that the authors highlight uh, is the potential here for stroke diagnosis. So often uh, one of the key aspects to stroke diagnosis is determining whether or not uh, the, there are brain hemorrhages. Uh, so uh, to test this uh, uh, possibility, they basically induced a, a synthetic uh, brain hemorrhage in this benchmark result, uh, and they've uh, shown at the bottom here how you can recover uh, that, the image of that brain hemorrhage using, uh, using FWI. So this has the potential uh, to be life-saving. Okay, so I'm pretty much at the end of the presentation now. I'll conclude with just some, some remarks to sum up, just on inversion in general. Uh, so inversion is, is far-reaching. It's a powerful methodology for solving a huge variety of complex problems, not only in geophysics, but across a multitude of different disciplines. 
it's extendable. And so inversion can be linear, it can be nonlinear, and it can be extended to incorporate uh, better physics and more physics. It's adaptable. Uh, so we've seen that inversion techniques can be uh, transferred from one field to another. So techniques developed in geophysics can be adapted to the medical field, for example. And there are lots of other examples of that uh, in different disciplines. And finally, it's ever changing. Uh, so inversion is a very live research topic. It remains a hugely active area of development uh, throughout the applied sciences, uh, engineering and, and mathematics. That's essentially my last slide. I, I'm happy to take questions uh, in, in a second. I would like to acknowledge the various uh, people at CGG who have helped me put this presentation uh, together. Thanks all to them. Uh, also, the, the field data examples, the seismic field data examples are courtesy of uh, CGG MCNV and TGS Joint Venture and CGG MCNV. Uh, and the synthetic examples that we've shown are courtesy of BP, uh, Chevron and the SEG. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? I should start by clarifying. I can, I can hear you. Yes, thank you, Oscar. Excellent. Excellent. We don't have any more uh, microphone troubles. Thank you very much for this absolutely amazing talk. It was very interesting hearing about the FWI methods and inversion in general. Um, we've asked the audience and they have provided uh, with uh, some technical questions, some non-technical questions more on the implications of science. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll first, so one, one person, Debbie, has asked, has written a bunch of questions. I'm okay. going to take one of your questions first, Debbie, and then I'm going to go to your question, Heather, afterwards, um, and then return to Debbie after that. So first of all, uh, Debbie's asking regarding um, um, how you define, how do you define the misfit between waveforms um, as it determines the adjoint source? Okay, yes, yeah, so this is a this is a great question. So in the context of FWI, this is a, so you can regard the recorded data and the model data as essentially a, a time series of amplitudes. So we have a, a discreetly sampled uh, time series of data. So this might be every one or two milliseconds, we sample and record the seismic data. So that gives us a time series of amplitude values. And when we talk about the data discrepancy or the data misfit, that's simply a sample by sample difference between the observed and model data which we then compute on a sample by sample basis and sum over all samples in time. Okay, um, then Heather's uh, saying, thank you very much for the talk and for the explanation of the SWI method. One of the main applications of these techniques uh, in subsurface imaging is for oil exploration. How do you feel about the ethics of developing this technology to extract fossil fuels, uh, which contributes to climate change? Um, and furthermore, asking whether as a scientist um, this is a kind of ethical debate you have, um, or do you think the development is justified by other applications such as medical imaging or carbon storage? I think that's a great question, and I think you've you've um, provided part of my answer in your question as well. So yes, it's it's obviously a, a, it's a very um, a sensitive topic, and it's a topic which has a lot of variables and a lot of different opinions involved in that. I, I prefer to think of this as a purely scientific. Uh, uh, question and as you rightly point out, the the applications here are are hugely varied and the potential is enormous. So um, I don't tend to think of it as something which is to be applied in the oil and gas industry. I think of it as something which can be applied much more generally uh, across a huge variety of different fields. Okay, um, Heather, does that answer your question? And um, if not, then please close the follow up question as we return to um, the second of Debbie's many questions. And after that, I'll take you, uh, Stephen. Um, so you briefly mentioned the conjugate, uh, conjugate gradient optimization schemes in the context of e-ghosting. Yes. Are you able to apply Newton's method, uh, methods um, computing the full Hessian to get information on the curvature of the misfit landscape? Or are you currently limited to approximations of the Hessian due to the computational cost of the forward problem in That's SWI? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so I would say in the context of deghosting, um, where we're using the, the conjugate gradient method and so on, because that is a linear um, uh, problem, um, this, that's a much simpler problem than the, the nonlinear problem of the full waveform inversion. So within that context of the linear inversion, um, things like computation of the Hessian and so on, that's not really something which we regard as problematic. Uh, so the linear inversion schemes that we have are very optimized and they're, they're essentially um, we're solving those inversion problems completely. When it comes to FWI, that's a much more complicated beast. So we can use, for example, the nonlinear conjugate gradient method or the, or the nonlinear steepest descent method on FWI. But when you actually, I've, I've shown you a very simplified 
um, uh, manifestation of the mathematics involved there. And when you talk about computing uh, the Hessian or the inverse Hessian, um, that's an enormously complicated uh, thing. Uh, so what we essentially got in the representation of FWI that I've shown here is essentially calculate uh, diagonal elements of that Hessian uh, and the off-diagonal elements uh, correspond to coupling uh, between various factors like um, velocity uh, and Q and so on. So that's, an in, that's a much more complicated layer of FWI, and that runs um, both in theory and in practice an enormously challenging uh, part of the, of the application. So that's very much for the future. Okay. Um, does that answer your question, Debbie? Um, and while, while we get a response from that, I'm, I'm going to move on to Stephen. Uh, yes, it does, she, um, they say. Excellent. Um, Stephen is saying, incredible research, especially it's used in medical imaging. My question is not too complicated. Um, I'm wondering, uh, on the ship doing, uh, wondering on the ship doing the ocean survey, how deep can the inversion technique reach under the surface? What is the coverage area of each ping when doing the ocean survey? Uh, and are there several centers combined simultaneously on the research ships? So I, I think I, I got the, that felt like a three part question. I think I heard the first and third parts. I might come back to you on the second part. So uh, for the first part, again, a fantastic question. So um, in terms of the, the, the depth that we can uh, penetrate uh, with the, the seismic uh, vessel, um, typically this corresponds to um, two factors. So firstly, it's, it's how big your air gun source is, what the volume, uh, what the capacity of your air gun source is. In other words, uh, how, um, how high a pressure wave field you can inject uh, into the subsurface, but it also corresponds to the length of the streamers uh, that, uh, that tail off the back of your boat. So both of those things are the limiting factor uh, in terms of how far you can penetrate into the subsurface. I would say typically we're looking at of the of the order of uh, you know somewhere between five and ten kilometers into the subsurface for a standard survey. But the the longer you go with your cable and the bigger you go with your air gun, uh, you can get deeper and deeper into the subsurface. Uh, I think for the third part of the question, you were asking whether or not we are essentially working in isolation in individual centres or all working together. Uh, so CGG is a, very much a global company. Um, so we have research centres in, in Italy, where I'm based in the southeast of the UK. But we also have research centres in Houston, uh, in Paris, in Oslo. And we all communicate with each other and we all work together on the same uh, on the same problem. So FWI um, is a technique. S sorry, yeah, going, yes. I, I I, I think I think and maybe maybe it's the audio crackling up. I think he was more asking regarding the sensors when you send out these pings, whether you have multiple different kinds of sensors on. Ah, on right. Sorry. Okay. This I <laughs> I completely no 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 that's that's the question. Sorry, I apologise. Uh, so yes. So in, so that's again a fantastic question. So um, what I've described here, uh, I presented this presentation in the context of receivers which are are called hydrophones. So those hydrophones they effectively record. Um, uh, the magnitude of the acoustic pressure wave field. So they're, um, in that sense, they are uh, scalar recordings uh, in that they don't record any particular direction uh, of that wave field uh, in terms of the, the amplitudes that they record. However, there are different ways of deploying different types of sensor in the subsurface. So another example would be something called a geophone, which, is, which uh, does indeed uh, um, determine what the direction uh, or uh, directional components of the wave field as it arrives uh, at the receiver. So with that information, you can do um, uh, more interesting and more um, uh, useful things with the seismic data. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, uh, to keep things simple, I, I talked about just hydrophones. But yes, indeed, there are different types of, uh, of sensor that you can uh, install in your acquisition, and they can achieve different things for you. OK, does that answer your question, Stephen? I think um, there was a second part to the question that I may have I may have missed. I didn't no, quite um, no, there was the depth, and there was whether there were several sensors. Okay, great. That that was, and then they also say thank you very much for the excellent presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, and then um, just sent a follow up message saying thank you very much for this incredible research. Um, and then returning to Debbie for for the third third part of their question. Um, they're asking how many inversion parameters are there currently are currently used in exploration uh, FWI. Uh, how do you mitigate the risk of crosstalk if possible at all? Wow, these are these are terrific questions. So um, I guess we touched on crosstalk very very briefly when we discussed the coupling of, um, for example, um, viscosity and uh, and velocity. So I would say that normally 
um, a lot of this a lot of this boils down to um, how much kind of computing resources you have and what the kind of practicalities of running the inversion are. In theory, I've, I've spoken about being able to invert for you know, velocity, viscosity, density, and so on. Um, in reality, the more ingredients you build into your inversion scheme, the more expensive things become. So I think we would, the, the predominant or the kind of primary um, ingredient that we will always invert for uh, is primary velocity, is, is compressional uh, P wave uh, velocity. And that's what we focused on mainly in, in the talk. But that in itself is not enough uh, to, to get the very best images. You also need to incorporate uh, certainly viscosity, certainly anisotropy, um, potential elasticity, although when you incorporate elasticity into things, things get much, much more complicated and expensive very, very quickly. Um, so that tends to be a, a kind of a bottleneck in terms of cost. Uh, so I'd say there's three main components of um, velocity, viscosity, and anisotropy um, are three of the key ingredients that you would invert for. Um, in terms of crosstalk, again, that's a very complicated uh, uh, thing to do. So you can imagine inverting for those three things um, independently of each other, uh, therefore thereby avoiding any crosstalk. The difficulty with that is that you don't respect the true sort of coupling nature uh, of all of those effects. And so your, your inversion result will be suboptimal. So you can, of course, do a joint inversion where you simultaneously invert for, for those three things. But of course, that adds to the computational cost as well. So in, in reality, it tends to be based on a kind of as and when needed basis. Uh, different surveys will have different requirements. Uh, and uh, in some cases, for example, the viscosity may be very benign across the whole survey. And so it's necessary in that case to invert for viscosity. OK, um, does that? Yes, they're saying amazing. Um, that does answer the question. Then I have a question regarding um, regarding the whole optimization landscape. Mm -hmm. How do you pick a good initial? So you have a rule for updating. How do you yes. pick a good initial model? so that you don't end up in in a wrong like in a wrong fit yes so you you've identified a um one of the biggest problems in fwi one of the biggest practical challenges which is the problem of local minima um so in the yeah. in the in the case of linear inversion so for the deghosting we talked about uh, at the beginning that's again a much simpler inversion scheme and local minima don't really come into the into the into the argument so as far as linear deghosting or linear inversion is concerned um the the starting guess is typically just zero everywhere. That's our standard starting guess, simply because there's no reason to pick anything else. So you can basically start from wherever you like in a linear inversion yeah. scheme, and you will get to the right answer. With FW, it's a much more challenging uh, question. So what we avoid is what we call cycle, cycle skipping in, in FWI speak, but cycle skipping is basically just a way of saying local minima. Um, so there are methods uh, available to help you get to a point where your starting model is good enough that you are somewhere within the basin of attraction uh, for that local uh, for that global minimum and away from the basin of attractions uh, for the for the local minima. So there are various processes. Uh, so I can point you to things like um, uh, multi-layer tomography, for example, which is another technique which is designed to get a very rough model of the subsurface, which is good enough to seed uh, an FWI to get those very high resolution models. But there are also techniques designed to uh, reduce the impact of those local minima in themselves. So you, you can potentially start from more inaccurate uh, starting models and still avoid those local minima uh, by sort of processing tricks within the FWI. So um, I can highlight things uh, in the literature, things like um, things like dynamic warping um, uh, and so on, which I don't, again, I don't really have time to discuss in here, but if you, if you email me offline, I can send you some resources on that. Um, so there are, there are ways of choosing better starting models, but there are also ways and means of mitigating the damage caused by, by poor starting models. Okay, thank you very much. That, that does answer the question. Um, okay, yeah. Um, then um, Stephen is asking another um, hypothetical question, he says. Um, research teams um, studying historic wrecks of, for example, the Titanic, has noted that the bow is buried 18 meters, uh, under 18 meters of sediment on the ocean floor. Um, uh, this is the area where the iceberg collide, collided with the ship. Hypothetically, could inversion technology probe through the 18 meters of sediment, image the remains of the bow, or would a size scan sonar uh, be potentially able to prove through sediment? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. Um, so um, the, some of the images that I wanted to show in this presentation but I wasn't able to um, are from high resolution FWI images where we can see to a sufficiently good resolution that we're able to pick out 
um, sort of man-made structures on the ocean floor, so corresponding to things like um, oil pipelines and so on. So the, the level of resolution in these very high resolution FWI imaging schemes is really getting down now to the level of a few meters uh, rather than yeah, a few kilometers. In terms of depth penetration, penetrating a few hundred meters into the into the subsurface uh, isn't a problem as far as, as far as FWI is concerned. I think we saw, if I can just go back up to um, one of my previous slides near the end of the presentation. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So we saw on this, uh, I'm not sure if you can make it out, but on this display on the top left, you can see some what look like uh, scars in the uh, in the subsurface here. This horizontal depth slice is taken around the, the seabed around the water bottom. And those scars correspond to marks made on the subsurface, on the sea surface itself uh, by, by icebergs. And we're able to image that uh, using the FWI imaging scheme. So uh, imaging is something which is buried 80 millimeters below the sea surface or the subsurface, um, which is of the size of you know, the hull of the Titanic. Uh, that's that's uh, definitely doable. OK, um, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Stephen, does that answer the question? I can see Stephen typing. Um, um, on on that note, um, I had a question. Um, we we quite often get the question that if somebody um, uh, if somebody was interested in this field, mm -hmm. are there any good um, are there any good books for undergraduates that you could recommend, or any good research um, resources for undergraduates you could recommend who are interested? In having or learning more about this field? Uh, I mean, crikey, <laughs> hundreds and thousands of, of resources. I mean, uh, so I can recommend, um, for example, looking at um, the SEG websites, the Society of Exploration Geophysicists, or the EAGE website. Um, they'll have a, a wealth of material on there on geophysics. Um, I'd recommend just looking online uh, for information on geophysics generally and reflection seismology. That will give you a good sort of basic introduction. As you can imagine, there are kind of thousands of, of, of kind of high level textbooks which dig into the details of how things like FWI work and so on. Um, but yeah, a huge variety of resources. Just just Google uh, seismic, uh, reflection seismology or geophysics and you'll, you'll get a wealth of information. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then I should also note for the previous uh, question, Stephen says, uh, incredible. Uh, I'm going to forward uh, your comments to folk uh, working on this project. Uh, much Thanks. appreciated. That's great. Thank you very um, much. Um, do we have any further questions uh, from the audience? I should ask. Uh, because I think otherwise, I think we'll probably uh, call this Q&A session to a close if I don't see anybody typing within the next minute or so. Um, there's been an absolutely, absolutely incredible uh, presentation. Very, um, it's been very detailed. It seems, how, how to say, it seems like it's a method that both has a lot of, well, actually, I should ask you, um, on the development of this method, it seems very much that the theoretical challenges have to some sense been solved. How do you optimize this as a numerical recipe? even further such that more problems get into reach is that a true assessment or um, i i would say i would say that's probably a fair conclusion to come to on the basis of the material that i presented here i think okay. reality is that it's a little bit more complicated than that so um, one okay. thing that we touched on on this in this q a session was the idea of the various different model parameters like the viscosity and the velocity and so on and the coupling between you and actually sort of um building practical inversion engines that can account for all of those things uh, is still a, a huge kind of challenge uh, for, for R&D. So I say it's theoretically, um, a lot of the challenges theoretically are, are solved in as much as we know the equations that we want to solve. Um, the, the challenge is in being able to, 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 to develop the practical engines to allow us to solve those equations in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, that, that does, yeah, that does answer, that does answer that question. And I guess also, it's very hard to study the underlying phenomena before you can build some intuition through through the imaging techniques. So the more exactly. you develop the computational techniques, the more oh wait, that's weird moment yes. you, you exactly. get. So that kind exactly. of further spurs on. Yeah, um, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, in that case, I don't see any more questions. So I think we will call this Q&A session to a close. Um, I see Joe is typing. That a question that a thank you that is a thank you james um you're very, you're very welcome <laughs> um 
in that case, uh, I think we'll turn off the YouTube live stream and you're very welcome to remain and I'll um, turn on my camera again and we can. Okay, yep, sounds good. Yep. And if anyone else would like to um, 